In the face of the persisting global economic crisis, which we've witnessed over the past five years, a number of economies have shown remarkable resilience um, in terms of uh, their continuing growth and their ability to defy the overall level of uh, difficulties being witnessed in other major global economies. Uh, these economies are referred to as emerging markets, and they are viewed as lands of opportunities, viewed as favorite destinations for the 21st century gold rush. Uh, and we have governments, we have uh, policymakers, we have uh, industry organizations advising uh, there are businesses and advising companies to pay particular attention to these emerging markets as a way of overcoming the continuing economic recession. Um, so these markets are viewed as exciting and as uh, potentially transform transformational in terms of uh, the economic fortunes of both companies and their home economies. And uh, this talk is going to focus on what it takes to do business successfully uh, in these economies. Uh, my name is Kevin Ibe. I'm professor of marketing and international business. Uh, I'm head of the marketing department at Stratclyde Business School. And in this talk, I'll be looking at aspects of uh, doing business in emerging markets. The outline I'll use uh, would include these objectives, or would cover these objectives. Uh, first, uh, I would try and define what we mean by emerging markets, um, and in so doing, give you some classifications, some of the key countries that are cited as emerging markets. I would also uh, explain why these markets are viewed as increasingly attractive and why they are sought after. Um, next, I will briefly discuss how companies might do business in these markets successfully, uh, how, how they could improve their performance and thrive in such uh, uh, economies. And then I would mention some of the key challenges which companies ought to anticipate and pro proactively manage, manage in these uh, emerging economies. So defining emerging markets. Um, the term emerging markets is widely used to describe economies that are widely considered frontiers of market opportunities. Um, and they are so considered because they are witnessing rapid economic growth. There is rising disposable incomes in these uh, countries. There is expanding middle class. Um, there is vast new uh, markets for consumer products, for services, for infrastructure. Um, and there is also increased supply of and access to global capital, technology, talent in these markets. Uh, so really exciting places, land of opportunities. But some of these, uh, most of these markets are also characterized by what we call high, higher transaction costs. There is lack of institutional maturity. Um, there is a, a concept referred to as institutional voids. Uh, in other words, these markets do not tend to have very mature institutions that would effectively facilitate the functioning of uh, markets uh, uh, in, 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 their, in their countries. So some of these difficulties uh, and some of these challenges are prevalent in, in emerging markets. Um, and because of that lack of maturity, they are referred to as emerging rather than um, you know, fully uh, matured and emerged markets. Now, classifying emerging markets, uh, there are quite a, a long list of countries that are uh, referred to as emerging markets. Uh, but amongst this uh, long list of countries, 
there, there, there is a tendency to look at the BRIC and others. The BRIC economies refer to Brazil, Russia, India, China. And that acronym was first coined by Goldman Sachs Jim O'Neill about 10 years ago, uh, used to capture those huge uh, 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 emerging economies with huge populations, enormous growth potentials, vast natural resources, and so on and so forth. Uh, these uh, four economies have shown remarkable resilience uh, over the past 15, 20 years and have grown particularly uh, 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 remarkably. Um, but there are others that have uh, also shown sustained growth and significant exciting prospects. Uh, included in that list would include would be South Korea, Turkey, South Africa, Indonesia, Mexico, uh, Poland, Saudi Arabia, Taiwan, Iran, Argentina, uh, Thailand. So there is uh, uh, there are quite a number of other countries that are uh, considered also lands of opportunities that are growing uh, healthily and robustly. Um, there are even more. Africa has been mentioned in a, in a number of uh, reports by highly informed analysts um, as uh, a continent, um, of course, very much neglected, but that has shown uh, uh, um, sustained growth. I mean, some of the country markets have shown sustained growth over the past five to 10 years. Um, Angola has been mentioned, Nigeria, uh, despite its difficulties, uh, it, it, it has been growing robustly, averaging uh, about 77% or more. Uh, Ethiopia, again, a lot of people remember Ethiopia uh, and, and connect it with famine and uh, hunger. Uh, but that masks the fact that uh, their economic performance over the past uh, recent years uh, has been very, very impressive. So there are uh, uh, other emerging markets, and there is a new acronym, uh, CIVET, uh, that, are, that have been used to refer to some economies to watch. Colombia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Egypt, Turkey. Uh, so these are additional uh, non-BRIC emerging markets. So why are emerging markets exciting? Um, I think we've referred to some of the reasons, but I, I would just like to summarize um, using some statistics from very authoritative sources. Uh, these economies are growing fastest. And according to the IMF, um, GDP growth to 2016 uh, in China and India are going to average 9.4% and 8% respectively. Okay, and if we consider the fact that a lot of uh, advanced economies are witnessing negative growth or flatlining, uh, the fact that there are economies growing at 9.4% and 8.8% uh, is impressive. Um, for example, uh, there is a, a statistic that the Chinese economy has grown fourfold in 10 years and now boasts about 300 million in the middle class and 267 billionaires. Uh, all these have happened within uh, the last decade. Um, and it, it, it's very, very impressive. Um, there is also a statistic that suggests that seven emerging economies, namely China, India, Brazil, Mexico, Russia, Turkey, and Indonesia, I expected to contribute at 45, about 45% 45 of uh, global GDP growth in the coming decade. So these are growth markets. Uh, more statistics, in 15 years, in 15 years time, 57% of nearly 1 billion households with earnings of uh, greater than $20,000 a year uh, will be living in the developing world. Uh, what does that tell us? It tells us that the developing world will now account for majority of uh, um, disposable income of that uh, uh, minimum threshold um, you know, in 15 years' time. Uh, and that is uh, 
very interesting and exciting for companies looking for markets for their products, services, for infrastructure, etc. Okay, and uh, I would also like to show you a Goldman Sachs summary of projections of a globe, gross national products of uh, major economies around the world by 2050. And what that suggests to us is that um, China would be the largest uh, uh, global economy by 2015 um, with 44.5 trillion gross national products, uh, followed by the United States um, with 35.2 trillion. Uh, and Europe, Western Europe would um, actually be relegated to the fourth position, uh, fourth position with 18.8 .8 trillion uh, GNP. So all it tells us is that um, they're like, they likely to be very exciting opportunities and market prospects in other parts of the world uh, other than the, 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 the Western economies. Um, so the, the status quo will change. But that, that, that presents exciting prospects for companies looking for market opportunities around the world. Uh, I would like to um, just round up this section on why emerging markets are important by drawing attention to also the link uh, between investing in emerging markets and corporate financial success. Uh, and this is a recent, a recent uh, uh, conclusion reached in, uh, in an economics, <coughs> in the Economist, uh, based on a survey that it, it, it did. Uh, and it says that among surveyed companies from developed markets that derive less than 5% of their revenue from activities in emerging markets, only 24% reported their financial performance as being better than their peers. By contrast, for developed country companies that derive more than 5% their five of their revenue from emerging markets, the share reporting better performance than their peers was just under 40%. In other words, firms that are generating uh, a lot of their revenue from developing countries tend to uh, achieve and record significantly higher level of profitability. Um, Okay, we'll, we'll stop here and, and, and continue uh, the second part of the talk. Thanks.